Yeah, if you don't know me, my name is Jody Hickerson. I'm from Mission Church in Ventura, and we are just your biggest fans. Like, we love hearing everything that God is doing in and through Slow City. We love this community um, up here so, so very much. We pray for you guys all the time, um, and I love the drive, too. This morning was just like gorgeous, like driving up to Slow. Love making this drive and love he- being here um, with you guys. Um, little personal stuff about me. I'm one of the pastors at Mission. Um, my husband Mike and I have been married for 22 years next month, um, so that's exciting. We have three daughters. Yeah, you can give it up for Mike. He made it this long with me. Um, uh, we have three daughters. They are 20, 17, and 14, um, so I'd just like to say that in case you feel led to pray for me occasionally from time to time. Like I, I would receive that, um, that prayers. No, they're awesome girls, honored to be their mom. Um, and I just love getting to be here. I love getting to know you, getting to meet you. Um, and I love this series um, that you guys kicked off a few weeks ago called Habits. I especially love the tagline of this series. I don't even know if you knew this series had a tagline, but I was looking at the graphic and the tagline of the series said, Developing Habits of Hope. And I love that so much because you know what? There are a lot of things in life that are overrated, but hope is not one of them. And I'm not talking about like wishful thinking kind of hope or blowing out the candles on your birthday cake or I hope the weather is good again for the parking lot or I really hope, you know, my team wins. Talking about real deal hope. And biblical hope is, is, is defined as this. It's the confident expectation that God is willing and able to do all that he's promised to do. And man, that kind of hope, that's the kind of hope that we need. That's the kind of hope that enables us to make it another day clean, another day sober. That's the kind of hope we need to keep trusting when we're going through hard things. That's the kind of hope that gives us a vision that is different for our future, different for our relationship. That's the kind of hope that shows us what life could be. And you know, so often we just lose hope. We just start believing, man, I think I'm stuck. I don't know how to get out of this. I don't know if things will ever be different. Maybe God doesn't care. Like, I don't think I'll ever have a healthy marriage. I don't think I'll ever be able to find friends that really know me. I don't know if I'll ever recover from this hurt or be able to be free from this addiction or this anxiety or this fear or this depression. And what we feel is hopeless. This is why I love this series and it's so important. Because, you know, hope doesn't show up like magic dust. You know, it just gets sprinkled and it's like, oh, I think I feel hopeful now. Hope is something that grows. It grows up in us as we develop these habits that connect us to the God of the universe. We get synced up with him. We start getting connected to God and the way that he designed us. And the more and the more we practice these habits, the more and the more we experience this deep confidence and expectation that God is who he says he is. And he will do and is doing all that he promised to do. You know, we say around here all the time, right, that because of Jesus Christ, there is hope for everyone. And that doesn't just mean a hope for heaven, which, you know, that's awesome someday. But this means a hope that our past can be redeemed. This this means a hope for today, what you're going through. This means a hope for tomorrow. I love the way that Paul um, puts this in in 2 Corinthians 1.20. He says, for no matter how many promises God has made, they are all yes in Christ. Like that's the hope because of Jesus. That Jesus is God's yes to you to fulfill all his promises. And Paul says no matter how many he's made, like how many promises has God made? Well, one count is um, 7,457 promises in scripture that God has made to us. And Paul is saying not a lot of them are yes, or not most of them are yes, or some of the time they're yes. He says all of these promises are yes in Christ Jesus. God has a yes in his heart for you, regardless of what is going on in your life and how hopeless you may feel. 
how rejected you may feel. Like your, your mom may have told you no, and your dad may have said no. Your kids may say no. Your boss may say no. Your therapist may say no. Your coach may say no. The IRS guy may say no. Your dog may say no. Your cat will say no, right? The, the, the job, the company, the college, they may all say no. That guy may say no. That girl may say no. But all of God's promises, 7,457 are yes in Christ Jesus. This is hope that we can have this confident expectation. God, will you save me? Yes. God, can you forgive me? Yes. God, do you hear me? Yes. God, can you cleanse me? Yes. God, can you bring freedom? Yes. God, can you give me strength? Yes. God, will you give me guidance? Yes. God, will you be my wisdom? Yes. God, will you be with me every day for the rest of my life? Yes. God, will you be with me after I die and take me home to live forever with you? And God says, yes, yes, yes. And when we start, when we start saying yes to God, and developing these habits that connect our hearts to his, that kind of real deal hope starts swelling up in our lives. We start to really live differently. It begins to change us. I mean, how would your life change if you lived every day with the confident expectation that God is fulfilling his promises to you every day? It changes us. And this habit that we're gonna talk about today, this habit of hope, Man, this one has a way of unlocking a part of our souls like like nothing else. Like seriously, it's unique. The habit of hope we're talking about today is worship. And what worship is is an, is an expression, right? It's, a, it's this expression of reverence and adoration to God. And I know that we can, you know, worship God in all sorts of ways. It doesn't have to just be through um, song or singing, right? We can worship God with the way that we live, with the way that we give, with the way that we put him first, with the way that we treat other people, with the way that we offer our lives. But I'm just telling you, there is something different and pretty unique about engaging in musical worship. We're commanded to do it because God knows this is syncing up. This is my heart to his heart. God knows that worship unbolts a part of our hearts that connects with his like nothing else. It reaches places in our soul like nothing else. And maybe you're thinking, like, not me. Like, you're not a musical person. Let me just ask you this. Have you ever watched a movie without the soundtrack? Like, that's like eating breakfast without coffee. Like, it just, it's just, like, pointless. I don't even know. Like, it's the music that stirs us, right? It's the music that makes us feel intense. It's the music that gives the story life. It stirs that deep emotion within us. Listen, you can hear a certain song, can't you? And it will take you back to a moment. Like songs can take us back to how we felt in a moment. If I hear 90s country, I'm sorry, it takes me to my childhood. You know, and I just, growing up in Kentucky, we were listening to Randy Travis and John Michael Montgomery and all of the 90s country. If I hear that, it can take me right back to sitting with my uncle and trying to sing the whole chorus of Sold in one breath. Like, that's what we were doing. If I hear Boys to men, I'm at my first breakup, you know, and we had come to the end of the road, and that's just like how it was. If I hear, come on, ride that train, I'm at prom. Like, I I remember what that was like. If I hear, you too, all I want is you, I am dancing with my husband at our wedding. I hear anything off of Taylor Swift's Red Album. It's like my girls are all of a sudden I'm transplanted and they're, and they're little girls again and we're in the car and they're just screaming like we are never getting back together, you know? And we're just having this, this joy-filled moment. Music does that. I know, you know, what's coming to your mind, a song that can take you back. And that is because music is hardwired in us. Literally, our bodies are made of music waves. It's in our genes. It's in our chromosomes. It's holding us together. The way that our brains neurologically respond to music is is astounding. I mean, science has proven over the centuries just how powerful music is in healing, in, in recovery, in pain management. It's used with seizures and strokes and anxiety and depression, and it can lower blood pressure. It can change your metabolic rate. It can reduce muscle tension. It can increase endorphin levels, improve cognitive skills, enhance your memory. I mean, it's, it's in us. 
Like we're hardwired. We are designed this way by God. And it's one of the primary ways that God invites us to connect with him, to open our hearts, to open our mouths, to open our lives and remember how great he is. Remember his promises. Remember who we are and who he is and give him praise. So whether you can sing like Adele or like a dud, it is amazing. Like how, and I know the poor guy sitting next to me over there, you know, it's amazing how music is hardwired in us. And that's because your God put it there. It is deep calling to deep. It is a longing inside every single one of us to connect with our creator. It is a song in us crying out to the composer. And I really believe any time authentic worship happens and, and when it becomes a habit in our lives, like when you're home alone and you're worshiping, Alexa, play Maverick City, and you're worshiping, when you're around a campfire and someone just starts to sing, how great is our God? When you're driving in the car, I'm, I've gotten so many looks on the 101, you know, because this is the, my private time with God. Like when we, when our hearts, wherever we are, when this becomes a habit and our hearts with all of our doubts and all of our fears and all of our hopes and all of our joy and all of our pain, when that connects to the heart of God, when the music in us connects to the one who put it there, there is just amazing healing and peace and security and wholeness and hope that takes place. Whoa, watch out. There goes an umbrella. Y'all good? Just making sure you're good. Okay, cool. Several years ago, um, I read this short little book. Um, it was called Holy Roar. It was written by a guy named Darren Whitehead and Chris Tomlin. And they walked through seven Hebrew words that are used for the word praise in the Bible. And I loved learning about them, not because I wanted to seem smart and like I know Hebrew before you guys today, but because they were really helpful practical ways for me to understand how I'm connecting to God in worship. So I just want to kind of fly through them um, this morning, giving us all some of these practical ways, whether we're singing in the shower or we got our AirPods in before, you know, in the locker room pregame, like ways that we can connect with God and how important this habit is. So the first one is this yadal, which means the hands of praise. It's, it, this is the definition, to revere or worship with extended hands, to hold out the hands. And listen, this is used 111 times in the Bible as a way of expressing reverence or excitement or awe for who God is. Psalm 67.3, may all the peoples yadal you, God, may all the peoples yadal you praise you with extended hands. And I know for some of y'all out here in the parking lot, when you look around and you see people, you know, that have their hands up and they're raised in worship, you may be thinking, these are not my people. Like, this is weird. Like, I don't know what is happening. I don't know why they're doing that. I don't know if they're just swept away. But listen, if you think about it, lifting up our hands is a pretty natural expression when we are excited or when we are in awe. Like this happens to me a lot during college basketball season. I am like, yes, you know? Or when my kid scores a goal and I can't hold it in, or it's the, it's the moving encore at a concert and everybody's like, yes. Or at the top of a hike, you go all Titanic on that thing and you're just like, yes, you know? And you extend your hands. And listen, this is the God who created it all. This, the God we are worshiping spoke it into existence. He is the all-knowing, all-powerful God. He knows every star, every grain of sand. He's numbered every hair on your head. For some of you dudes, like, you know, he's not replacing them, but he knows. He knows, and he knows everything. He's the inventor of chlorophyll and photosynthesis. He's the maker of our DNA. He stands in the depths of the ocean, and he's still ankle deep. Like, this is the God who can play marble with the planets. I mean, my team hits a shot at the buzzer, and I'm like, Hallelujah! This is my God who saved me and rescued me. This is an expression in worship that says, God, you are bigger than it all, and I am in awe of you. I am amazed by you, and I'm giving you all my reverence and adoration. Then there's this word, how law, which is the fools of praise. And this one means to boast, to rave, to shine, to celebrate, to be clamorously foolish. 
Psalm 149.3, let them halal his name with dancing and make music to him with tremble and harp. Like this is the kind of way we worship where our attitude is not casual about what God has done. We're not like, you know, amazing grace. We are ready and expectant to celebrate God. And we may dance and we may clap and we may make music and look like a fool. But we were also created to celebrate and rave and to shine and to not worry about what we look like and not worry about what anybody is thinking except for our God who we are praising and celebrating. One of my favorite events um, at Mission that we've done over the years is this prom that we throw for special needs students in our community. Um, It's called Night to Remember. And this is like over the years it's grown and grown. It's like thousands of people. Um, hundreds of special needs students, hundreds of hosts that are high school students, and then just hundreds of volunteers and our staffs out there. And I'm telling you, it gets real crazy on the dance floor. And I'll let you know right now, like a lot of us cannot dance. But this night, it's not like the DJ's playing worship music, but I'm telling you, it's worship. It's this, it's nobody caring at all what they look like, but they're willing to be clamorously foolish in order to love other people, in order to celebrate other people, in order to bring a little piece of heaven down touching earth. And I think God loves it. Then there's Zalmar, the music of praise. Like this one means to make music. Like this is our voice, this is our instruments, to celebrate in song, to touch the strings or parts of a musical instrument. Psalm 144, 9, I will sing a new song to you, O God. On a harp of 10 strings, I will, I will zarmar to you. And I know that like not all of us play an instrument. If you do, man, that's amazing. I'm so, aren't you guys so grateful for the worship team here that leads us in worship? He's about, yeah, give, I mean, it's amazing that they show up and they volunteer their time. But listen, Zalmar is what they're doing. This isn't song time. This isn't show time. This isn't performance that we evaluate. While they are making music with the strings and on the drums, while they are leading us, they are Zalmaring for an audience of one. So if you play, play, and if you sing, sing. And I know already you're like, I'm 0 for 2. I can't, like, I can't do either. I'm not a singer. Like you think you can't carry a tune. This is what my friends in Kentucky would call a jailhouse singer. You're like behind a few bars and you can't find the key. You know, that's like how it is. But I'm telling you, it doesn't matter. You, like all creation, were wired with an internal song. Every single one of us. You just watch a little kid. You see little kids, they just start singing and dancing and nobody has to tell them to. It's wired in us. And honestly, if you are a Christ follower, if you're a follower of Jesus, this isn't an option. This is a directive. This is a command that we've been asked to sing. And you may say, I'm an awful singer, but I've got this theory that God just like transposes it on the way up. And it sounds like really good by the time it gets to him, right? You know how like your kid makes something like an artwork and, and you, you bring it home from preschool and you're just like, wow, that is something, you know? But you put it on the fridge because, man, that's your kid. I really believe God's got like this huge refrigerator door and he's like, that's my girl. She can't sing, but man, I love her. And I love what she's offering me. That's my kid. That's my kid. So if, even if you can't sing, sing. You may never get a four-chair turn. You will get the chair to turn of of the one that matters. Then there is to Tudal, the expectation of praise. This one means an extension of the hand, again, thanksgiving, a sacrifice of praise. Get this, thanksgiving for things not yet received. Like this is a sacrifice of praise. This is an expression where we show up and we worship or we worship in our private moments when we don't feel like it. We don't even know what we have to give, but we worship anyway to say, even in my hardest times, God, I can come to you. I can connect my soul to you. I believe you're going to meet me here. I can give you thanksgiving for things not yet received or circumstances that have not yet changed because I believe you are good. And man, this expression, this sacrifice of praise, this This Thanksgiving, when a grateful heart swells up to sing, something powerful happens. 
When we take the time to still be aware, even in hard times, that God is good, this is a song that sweeps away entitlement. This is a song that battles discontentment. It changes our perspective. Psalm 56 says, in God I have put my trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Vows made to you are binding upon me, O God. I will render to Tao to you. And David wrote that when he was hiding for his life. Like when he didn't know how it was going to turn out. But he could still extend his hand and say, I praise you for who you are, even in the midst of this. And I trust you for whatever is coming. Reminds me of a woman I knew. She was, when I was in high school, she was in her 80s. But she was one of our student ministry volunteers. Her name was Fanny Hamilton. And she was in a wheelchair. She'd had a stroke, and it paralyzed the left side of her body. And she just loved being around students, and she was just so joyful. But, man, she loved God. And I would watch her as students are jumping and and worshiping. I would watch Fanny over there in her wheelchair, and she would take her good hand, and she would lift up her hand that didn't work, as if to say, even in this, I extend my thanksgiving to you, God. You are so good. Then there's the posture of praise. Barak, to kneel, to bless God as an act of adoration, to praise, to salute. Psalm 103, 1 and 2, Barak the Lord my soul, my inmost being, praise his holy name. Barak the Lord my soul and forget not his benefits. I mean, this is a posture, right? When we kneel, I'm guessing not many of us have ever knelt before someone. But man, when you see in scripture, people that encounter the glory, the presence of God, they hit the ground because he is so worthy. What weight, what honor to kneel before him. This posture says, it is not about me. It is lowering ourselves, humbling our hearts, keeping our eyes on God. And again, this is just from my own personal experience. I don't know if you relate to this, but sometimes we approach worship like we're consumers. Like we will say things like, how was church today? And we'll be like, it was pretty good, yeah. I give it a six, you know. It was that one girl again. I don't know. Brent was weird. I don't, you know, and we, we, we start to evaluate. I didn't know many of the songs. The, you know, it was a little loud. And we start to evaluate. And listen, I'm, just for me, what I've discovered in my own life When that happens, when worship becomes about my experience and my wants and my needs and my taste, it becomes a me-centered consumer kind of thing instead of being someone who wants to be consumed by the presence and power of God. So Barak, man, show up humble. Walk into worship in a posture of praise that says, God, you are above it all. And I believe you will meet me here instead of me showing up expecting that my needs will be met. Then there's the songs of praise. Tehila, not tequila, okay? That is a different thing. Um, but this is a, a hymn, a song of praise. It's, it's called a new song or a spontaneous song. This is like about just bursting out in praise. Like sometimes, it, sometimes it's an old song, but it just hits different, you know? Like you're going through something, God's teaching you something, you've heard that song a thousand times, but man, it's a new song to you today because of the way you've opened your heart to connect with God. Psalm 43, he put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise, Tahila, to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. And maybe you've experienced this, you know, at times where you just have to sing out. You just have to thank Jesus Or there's a melody that wells up in you as you're driving in the car. For me, it comes out kind of like a rap. You know, sometimes it's a little bit like a spoken word, my my tahila that comes out of me. It's like it's under my skin, on the tip of my tongue, and bursting within. My the beat of my heart, it pounds like a cymbal. It races and paces, keeping just the right tempo, like I was made to worship. Made to sing a new song, made in his image for his glory all along, that every strand of DNA and every strand of hair gone gray and every breath that breaks away and every ounce my body weighs will not let the music stay. The melody can't be kept at bay. My lungs swell up and rush to say, my God, you're worthy. At your feet I lay all of me. 
mind, strength, soul. I offer my praise, surrender control. My vocal cords tremble, my hands stretch to the sky. I dance, clap, shout, applaud, and amplify your name, your fame, your splendor, your renown, your brightness, your rightness. I humbly fall down before the rocks cry out. I'm gonna make my sound as your prize creation. My worship abounds. There's a song in me. And there's a song in you, a melody, something bursting that only you can say to your father. And it's in you, a new song. And then lastly, Shabbat, this is to address in a loud tone. This is like, we're shouting. This is to commend, to glory, to triumph, to shout his praises. Psalm 145, 4, I love this verse. One generation will shabak your works to another. They will tell of your mighty acts. And isn't that cool? That like when worship becomes a part of our lives, we're connecting with God in this way. This is a habit. We're actually shouting God's goodness to our world from one generation to the next that as we connect in worship, it becomes an anthem that resounds. So man, whether you are alone in your apartment or in your house or in the backyard or in your dorm room or you're out for a run or you're on a hike or you're out in the water or you're walking to school or you're getting ready for the game, sorry about that. Man, make this a habit to connect with God, to open your heart and praise, like sing, let the words come out, shout, write, freestyle if you want, lift your hands, God will meet you there. It's a habit of hope. And one of the coolest things that happens when we worship is that we're literally joining with all of creation. Did you know there's music in here, but there's music out there? Like scientists have discovered out there in space, like this black hole that's playing a B flat, like 57 octaves lower than the human ear can hear, but it's, it's playing. It's out there ringing, setting the key for praising our creator. This is more from the Psalms. It says the oceans have lifted their voice, the seas with their pounding waves. It says the fields and the crops burst out in joy, the forests rustle with their praise. The river rapids clap their hands with glee. The hills sing out their songs before the Lord. The mountains burst into song. The trees clap their hands. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. And listen, I just want you to know, the stars do a pretty good job. And the ocean does a pretty good job. And waterfalls do a pretty good job. And the over 600 species of beetles on this planet, they do a pretty good job. And the mountains and the fields. But we are his rescued sons and daughters, created in his image to connect with him. More than anything else in all of creation, we got to give him our worship and develop this habit of hope. God, I thank you for the privilege it is to be in your presence today. And Lord, I pray in this moment we would unlock our hearts and open our souls to give you all of our praise. In Jesus' name, amen.